everyone, and welcome to the Jeff Fuller Show. Today I have with me Dan Morris. Now, Dan is going to have a strange accent to those of you who live in America because he actually has an English accent. He escaped the motherland in about 2008 when the big nasty GFC showed up um, and has been trapped in America ever since. Um, <laughs> so welcome to the show, Dan. Jeff, thanks very much for having me. It's, uh, it's certainly, certainly been more joyous than that. <laughs> <laughs> so just a little bit about Dan. He's a, a B2B growth expert. So uh, a lot of our audience are in the market of B2B, generating leads, getting to the next level. Uh, he's also a founder of Jorvik, or general partner at Jorvik Ventures, which provides funding to, to companies as well. So Dan's about uh, growth for B2B companies and uh, we're going to dive into some of the uh, challenges and opportunities and uh, the frameworks that uh, Dan has when he uh, helps founders out to grow their business to the next level. Yeah. So Dan, what got you into this really exciting era of B2B uh, area? Um, <laughs> well, actually, way back, I was in a band. Uh, we thought we might have a shot. But we found out very quickly the lead singer got signed to a recording contract and the rest of the band didn't. So I got into a banking career right. and uh, it, was, it was working for one of the large banks. But I quickly realized that really wasn't for me. Things were moving to very slowly and it just couldn't get excited about it. So, so I started working with smaller, fast growing companies. And um, over the last 15 years, I've been helping founding teams in the US and the UK and Australia to develop sales processes, accelerate growth. Some of those results, are, you know, a digital agency that ended up exiting for 100 million, uh, getting a content marketing agency and, and helping them get to 61 on the ink list in the, in the US, which is huge, uh, winning Fortune 100 companies for other early stage companies. And really over those years of supporting those businesses, we've always seen that, you know, founding teams either don't have the time or they just don't have the experience to be able to focus on developing that repeatable process that helps them to grow. Mm -hmm. And they often end up making painful mistakes like hiring salespeople too early and then having to have that difficult conversation, which puts them back in a sales role uh, or hiring too fast and people don't reach productivity and they're burning through cash. And so really we've just been focused the last few years on helping founders get out of that sticky problem uh, by actually giving them that, that time, that experience, that, that help. Uh, and it's just really good fun working with people who are trying to develop sustainable businesses, businesses they want to work in, uh, businesses they want to develop, uh, and just helping them to get to that next stage. So it's, that's what's fun about it for, for me and the team. And um, yeah, it's been an interesting journey to get to, to here. <laughs> so, um, was there a aha moment where you went, oh, I really don't like this big corporate slow growth um, environment and you're going, I'm really excited by the smaller dynamic teams where you feel you can make a difference? Was there like a, a day, a moment uh, where you went, was there, a, was there a story behind that at all? Well, there's a stepping stone to it. So I was, at, I was at university and I was working on get to get into this large bank. I got into the large bank, started getting a, a lot of training in negotiation and, and working with consumer credit. And um, they just wouldn't let me do more. They wouldn't let me work more. Like they, it was, it was while well, I was at university into this sort of shift program, they just couldn't give any flexibility to having more hours and letting us do more, even though I was one of their top performers. I thought, well, hang on, I can't be in this giving all my energy and all my focus to one thing if they're not gonna let it go as far as it can. And so I went and worked with a smaller finance company. And that, as, it found, as I found out, was not run ethically. Uh, and very quickly ended up looking at it and going, do I really want to show up every morning? That guy's got a beautiful Aston Martin outside, which was motivating to me. But could I actually get to where he was going to go when nobody on the team had any sort of reasonable commission earnings? Nobody would ever hit a goal. And I, that was an initial first taste for me of, hang on a minute, this is a whole sales team who's been sold something that nobody's reaching. So I, I got out of that and it was a, an excellent recruiter. His name's Trevor. 
Uh, and Trevor put me in an interview, uh, a PPC and SEO company that really got me into, right, well, here's a, here's a whole new canvas to paint on. And it was very early in PPC and SEO. So that was something where I could really get in, be fascinated by it, develop processes. And it was bundling the services together that really helped us get high, high effects for the clients, but also high margins for the agency. And then building a team, showing other people how to do that, help them to accelerate. And that's, that started sowing the seeds of the, the creativity that I have uh, to put these sorts of sales processes together. But then actually, well, hang on a minute, let me go and do this for another business. Let me try and do it for another business. I had a couple of hits and a couple of misses, but I realized that that repeatable process of review, where we're at, what we've got, what collateral we've got, refine, how can I make this better? Roll out the changes myself, test them, and then take them to other people, and then replace, take yourself out of it and put somebody in your, in your position, actually stuck. And I, and I did that for a few years, became a CEO, uh, and then went into the consulting mode to go and do it for more people. So it's, it's really been using that framework of review, refine, roll out, replace for, the, for all these years, just to go, how can we make this better? How can we make that even better? How can we show other people how to do it? And then how can we get out of the way so mm-hmm. that they can get on with it? You mentioned one thing um, that I think is quite important, and that is um, packages. In other words, um, yeah. packaging up services. And I think uh, a lot of especially smaller consultants just say sell their time. They don't package anything up. Um, I have heard that even adding a giving the package a name like platinum or something like that, or it can work. Can you tell us a bit about um, some. Do you have some insights on packaging that you think are good, especially for B two B and services based businesses? Yeah, sure. So um, services based businesses can sell things in in bundles or tiers. So good example back in back in those days of the agency, the first example I cut my teeth with was I had an incentive to sell PPC. I also had an incentive to sell SEO. But the compensation plan that I had helped inform what my bundle should be. Nobody thought of it before, but I sold them both together. And that meant that as a salesperson, I made more money. So as a business owner, If you're a marketing agency owner, look at what your incentive plan is actually showing your salespeople how to what to do. See if you can make your incentive plan make it more sense, make more sense for them to start selling bundles of products together and that let their let their creativity inform what they're able to put in front of a customer. I, I was able to massively improve the amount of margin the agency made by bundling together two services, which meant as a salesperson I made more. So as I've gone through over the years and and advised services businesses and SaaS businesses, it's always been, how can we get people to the next level? You know, if you're selling content, for example, uh, you know, what, how many units of content do they need for the primary project that they've got? And what else are their goals leading them towards that we could potentially bundle into that? You know, if you're doing a, a series of blogs, for example, well, would it be useful to have videos to go with this? And can you put some sort of incentive together to get those two, two, those two things together? And then is there a social element to this? Well, of course there is, right? And so, you know, thinking about what the customer is actually going to need together and then making it easy. Uh, mm-hmm. Buy a t-shirt, buy a pair of pants, buy a hat for $29.99. No, buy a t-shirt, buy a pair of pants and get the hat for free. Uh, it's, a, it's a whole different way of bundling it, isn't it? That's interesting on the bundling side, and I do like uh, the aspect of and this comes, I suppose, into areas like uh, premium content that could be maybe sold behind a paywall. Um, now, you work with uh, software as a service type companies. You yeah. you mentioned a story before in a little um, pre-recording um, chat. You mentioned a company that it was for seven years. Software as a service type company was turning over only two hundred and fifty thousand dollars, and now it's turning over one point two five million. Can That's you maybe right. can you maybe tell us about um, that that story and um, what happened there? Yeah, sure. I can I can tell you a little about that. So, like a lot of businesses, they'd started off in one direction and and started and put money behind going in that direction and then iterated and changed things again and had a revenue spike, which then fell off. 
and then tried something different and then tried something different and then tried several things at once. Now, this probably sounds quite familiar to a lot of people listening. And, you know, it's sometimes how you get to your product market fit. You just keep iterating and changing until you get to the right thing. But they'd been at this for multiple years and uh, they would got to a point where they just said, look, OK, we know where we want to go, uh, but we could use some help. And uh, ultimately, they just needed to focus more. So, you know, when we looked at all the customers that they had and the customers that were really sticking and the customers where we had the best partner network for them. So other, other technology businesses and other experts who endorsed their product or had, they had a customer in common, where was the best place for us to focus? And then they also used to get all of their leads from trade shows. So how could we improve the frequency of getting in front of that audience? And so when we reviewed, we realized that first of all, they had good people in place. They had a really good product. The process that they were using needed to be simplified, mm -hmm. right? It was designed to do a lot of things, but actually it could be simplified. And I'm talking about even the stages in the CRM. What does the process actually, what are they actually doing? And does the CRM map it? So one of the things we've noticed is if you're a marketer and the sales team are not entering information into CRM, Mm -hmm. Your marketing automation is not really going to do much good because no. you can't start using all the advanced features of the tool. And in, in this case, they're using HubSpot. So you've got brilliant life cycle stages. You've got the opportunity of passing leads over that come in from inbound. They're, are they MQL? Are they not? So we refined the MQL. We got that to be really clear. We retrained and the process began to develop momentum. And so They've improved like average order value. Their close rates have been really good throughout the year. COVID actually helped them. Mm -hmm. And the reason why was because they were able to do more events with their partners in a short period of time. It pivoted the value proposition of their product to help their end customer deliver more value during COVID. And so they had this enormous uh, bump in the middle, which then calmed down significantly and now we're picking, we're picking up the volume again. And it's been a really interesting year because that bump taught us a lot. And we were able to refine a whole lot of information with them about who their ideal customer really is. And now as we go into 21, more confident than ever about building the team up and building out the, the right partners to get them to the right size deals that are going to give them even more confidence. And meanwhile, they 5X their revenue. And so that's been a really fun way of making sure we had the foundations in place. COVID didn't rock the boat, allowed us to, to handle a lot of stuff effectively. And definitely they had a fun year. Well, that's certainly quite an increase, 500% increase in revenue. You mentioned the term MQL. Some people won't, maybe don't know what that acronym means. Can you explain what an MQL is? Absolutely. A marketing qualified lead is the uh, point of a lot of arguments between sales and marketing people. <laughs> <laughs> it, is, it is the definition of a lead that also meets other criteria, such as the right size of business or the right, the right job title of a person within the target business. And if it meets a couple of those different criteria, and in this case, it's the right number of salespeople on a team, uh, you know, the right industry that they're in, then it can be passed across to a salesperson to work. And so rather than just working every lead that comes through, you can apply priority to those that meet other criteria that it ultimately it helps improve the close rate from um, meeting to deal. And this is a very interesting tension, isn't it, between marketing and sales. Sales exactly. saying the sales go to marketing, not producing enough leads, and marketing says, well, we're sending lots of leads. And then the sales team says, well, they don't convert because they haven't been qualified well enough. Yeah. Um, so I think this is a common problem. So can you, tell us a little bit, can you tell us a little bit about how you solve that problem for companies? Yeah, so... Once we understand, once we've done the review process, we can then share the information. So if you imagine a spreadsheet where the finance team has told you that your best customers 
listed A to Z down the side, spent this much money last year. And then marketing can tell you the name of the person at that company that is in the database and maybe their job title. But what you really want in order to be able to create a, a, an addressable market is more, right? So what it, let's, let's use a SaaS company as an example. They're gonna to want to know what other technologies that company uses that they wanna to sell to. They're gonna to wanna to know their revenue, their location, whatever else is relevant to their business. That's where you really start getting uh, into the details. And so if you can then agree that people who match those criteria are going to be the best place for sales to spend their time, then you can also agree that marketing can invest their budget to go and get more people that look like them. And so if you start using, rather than just get me a number of leads, which could be people filling in their name on a, on a lead form and nothing else, but instead focus on how many MQLs do we need in order to create the right amount of pipeline, you then get the sort of alignment between sales and marketing that keeps them better focused Mm -hmm. There's always discussion, always mm -hmm. discussion. But people are more aligned about, okay, well, if we do get 150 MQLs, then we're expecting to close X number of deals out the back of it. Our average sales cycle is this number of days. And you can actually start creating a much more a, a stress relief model. Uh, so you can really begin to predict what's going to come out of the pipeline at the other end, rather than just knowing that everybody's busy. Um, spinning their wheels. Spin, spinning their wheels. Busy. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, spinning exactly. Their, yeah. So um, interesting that you're going, you can start with a lead that is just a phone number and name put into a form where they download content. And this is where we had a little chat about that too before, which was um, how do we use content to provide a marketing qualified lead that is going to work and, and close better? Um, so let's maybe explore a little bit about the role of content in um, what you do and what you advise to companies because content marketing is a big, big word. It was Absolutely. all, ex it was all exciting. HubSpot were one of the original, um, they called it inbound marketing initially. Um, I got excited when I read David Meeman Scott's book, the new rules of marketing and PR in 2007, 2008. Um, and I went, wow, customers actually reach out to you rather than you actually having to chase them. Because I, I came from a sales background and I used to uh, basically cold call two hours a day. And uh, as that is not a fun job. In fact, it's even tougher today because of you know, caller ID now. Um, I don't answer any phone call that I had, is not in my contact list. End of story. Um, and I can guarantee that if they don't leave a message, uh, it's a cold call from someone trying to chase me. So, so to, let's talk a little bit about uh, the role of content-based marketing uh, to help provide good qualified leads for sales. Yes. And so let's go into that. Yeah, for sure. So content on its own can do a lot. You know, people are researching have ever since back in those days of 2007, 2008, when people started blogging and creating content and, you know, beginning to invest in regular content on their website. Uh, you know, I was in a, a very, very happy place of working with an agency that was at the early stages of that content marketing wave. And we served a lot of companies that just needed content for their website to be relevant. And uh, we grew and we grew and we grew and ended up hiring hundreds of writers because it was such a, a huge surge. And it's always con it's continued ever since. And so what we've got now is every real brand out there has got to develop their own content. They've got to understand where people are at in terms of are we attracting people? Are we getting them to consider our offering or are we actually at the decision stage where they need different types of information? And I, I'm sure your audience is very familiar with that. You know, the, the, the content marketing, the marketing funnel, very important to recognize that there's different bits of content are created for different reasons. And so from a growth perspective, looking at marketing and sales, it's really important to give each one of those bits of content a score. And so if you're using an advanced marketing tool like HubSpot and the HubSpot CRM, for example, 
uh, you know, other solutions are available. Uh, you know, you can actually give a score to people visiting web pages that meet within a certain category of topics. You can give a score to certain things being downloaded. So you might give one point for somebody visiting a certain web page. You might give 10 points for somebody downloading a piece of content. You might give 15 points for somebody attending a webinar that you've organized with a partner. You might give a higher score for somebody filling out a form. And let's say your theoretical point score that you want people to be at is 50. Uh, and you know, so you've captured their email all the way at the top, they get to 50 points, and then that is one thing that says, hello, I'm raising my hand, I have high intent. And so at that point, there's a really, really good history of what content has done to build up uh, a score in order to tell the sales and marketing team, hey, um, I'm, I've got high intent, I've been looking around these specific pages. And once you start recording that data and working with it, you can then refine it month on month, quarter on quarter, and refine your lead scoring so that you can agree that that lead score driven factor can be the thing that creates, that is the difference between a lead and a marketing qualified lead. And that's where the collaboration with sales and marketing really can be great because if they're looking at, hey, Jeff's been and seen all these different pages on the site, he's downloaded this bit of content and now I'm talking to him, this is great, he's already informed. Let me ask some more, more questions about the topics he was interested in to see if he's got everything he needs. And, and that just helps to tie the whole thing together uh, and, and helps prioritize the next bit of content that you might want as well. That's, that's really interesting. And uh, you know, for me, when I started out, and I started a blog in 2009, uh, blogging was hot, it was at the peak of its uh, popularity. Um, and I didn't do any lead scoring and uh, I just created leads. I got approached by companies all around the world or conferences to speak at conferences and, you know, to consult when I did consulting back then. Um, I just did it through blunt force trauma, right? Just create a lot of content and people would send me an email, right? I had no idea what their score is. Um, so, well, my, so can you talk us through maybe the stages of a B2B marketing qualified leader in maybe a little bit of a structured way if you've got sort of like if you go into a company going okay so what sort of content do you have this is part of your review i'm sure mm -hmm. um talk us a little through how to get people from top of the funnel maybe to uh, where you actually it's worth making that phone call or having that zoom call so maybe you could uh, take us through that a little bit because i think that'd be great for people to know especially in b2b marketing or B2B businesses, because I think this is a challenge everyone has is everyone talks about the funnel, but quite often it's just a messy matrix. Um, it sure is. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, it's, it's like the matrix. It's like you're in this cube, this world that uh, things come from this way. Sometimes they come down from that way and sometimes they come from that way. Um, and you're going, okay, so take us through what you see, the marketing funnel or the marketing matrix. <laughs> it's 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 funny like some some businesses will be into the random acts of marketing uh and you know just creating content because it sort of it sort of makes sense to them at the time uh and they end up with a huge amount of content but it's not really organized in a way that takes people through what they actually need to know so you know it, it Let's use HubSpot's terms. I'm a big fan of HubSpot. Obviously, we work with all sorts of different CRMs and different marketing automation tools all the time. But I think these guys have, have got really good terminology around it. So awareness is the top of their is the top of the funnel, right? So you want to try and attract as many subscribers as is possible by covering larger topics. You know, they're talking about what's going on in the industry, top 10, top five, those sorts of things. Now yeah, when we're looking at it, that is, yeah, it's a relatively low score because it's just a, a very early stage um, bit of content that's there. And so, you know, the marketing team would be running targeted campaigns for people who visited the website, retargeting them to get them to, to download a piece of content or to engage in, in some more of the web content. Uh, you'd have your social media team working on driving people back to those web pages, those sorts of things. And then in the consideration stage, really, it's uh, helping people into that experience. So something that is, has been quite common in e-commerce 
is, you know, if you join an e-commerce um, mailing list, you quite often get a welcome email. And something that will, will hit you there is welcome email with an offer. Well, if you do that in the B2B space and you give people a couple of welcome emails that tell them a bit more about what you do and a bit more about the, the kind of people that you've helped, you can actually start adding up uh, a whole lot of extra experience for that person who's just downloaded one bit of content. So, you know, that could be one specific campaign that you could do that's three or four emails long that actually really increases the lead score of that one bit of content rather than just going, okay, well, they fill the form in, let's leave them alone for a bit. That two or three, two or three, four emails in a welcome email can be really powerful to get people onto your page. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that helps to get them into, actually, I like the way that these guys think about this problem that I'm having. And, you know, what more can I learn? And so you have the opportunity then to push them to other bits of content that have the next step on the path, right? So that might be a how-to. Now, if you've got a piece of software and you need to work out how to implement this thing, or even the timeline, if you think about a company and they are, they're revolving from a spreadsheet to a CRM, to a CRM with email capabilities, to a CRM with marketing automation, there's going to be different things that they face along the way, right? And if you're a software provider that needs to educate people about where they are now and where you fit, that's a really good time to be giving them those bits of content. So there's comparisons, there's, you know, typically people also have these softwares at this stage, all sorts of stuff in the middle there. And then you, they might watch a, a short demo on one of your pages, at which point they might actually want to talk to one of your salespeople. And then they end up in a, a conversion, a decision place, right? So you've got awareness, you've got consideration. Should I be talking to this vendor? Should I not? And then you've got decision, at which point you can share with them case studies, you can share with them testimonials, you can share with them ROI calculators, all of those sorts of things at that stage that can really help them get to that next level where they're ready to say, okay, I've done all the math, I've considered all the variables, now I'll, I'll have a one-to-one -one demo with your salesperson and all being well, they become a customer and you put them into the advocacy world where, hey, you, if we can help you be really successful, can we work together on a case study? Will you speak with, at, with us at this virtual event that we're doing with our partner that you also work with? And, you know, really working with that person all the way through their journey is marketing to sales to customer success. And you've probably got the partner team involved in that as well because there are other technology partners involved. And then you can leverage their networks because that you're both working with this customer now and isn't it a great case study to show when x software works with y software this customer is like you and they're happy so that's that's how we think about it it, it definitely doesn't end when the sale is uh, completed and there's lots of variables on the way down that funnel of course but that's a pretty solid way of looking at it so really it's we're describing four steps in the marketing matrix or the sales marketing funnel. Uh, number one, awareness. Number two, consideration. The other one then is conversion or sale. And then the last one, decision. which is, is just, well, it's decision. That's the third one. And then the fourth one is advocacy, isn't it really? So, yeah. <clears throat> so, which is where they become advocates for your business because you produce such a great result for them. Maybe let's have a quick, um, snapshot of maybe the types of content that would sit at in those various stages is a bit of a summary. So let's look at the types of content that you need at every stage, um, those four stages in the sales funnel. So number one, awareness. What sort of content would you put in there generally? Um, yeah, so the, the sorts of stuff that would go in there, I was actually just going to pull up a visual. Uh, the sorts of stuff see sometimes it could be like uh, a uh, 21 ways to grow your business could be you know, like an ebook at the oh, top yeah. of the front yeah yeah so the, yeah. the sorts of stuff that we're thinking about uh, is is content it's campaigns it's ebooks and white papers 
mm-hmm. it is you're going to go to an event or a trade show and you're uh, promoting that across your different channels. Uh, maybe you're doing a press release about a customer that you won or a, a problem that you solved. You're out there in your social media or you're taking part in webinars, those sorts of things. They're all top of funnel. People have never heard of you before, but they might bump into you when they're looking to try and solve that problem or they're trying to search around it. You know, So those sorts of things are how to's, how to avoid uh, causing this problem, how to solve this problem, how to successfully implement uh, these sorts of tools, best practices for rolling out these sorts of things. They're great bits of content for that awareness uh, stage or the sort of the what you need to know about uh, types of content. So you, you think about it in that way, it's the how to or the, yeah, the, the best practices or the how and you can share that in those sorts of ebooks and white papers for downloads. So that those initial form fillers, mm-hmm. the getting to an event or a trade show and being seen on stage or you're bumping into people, well, virtually these days, uh, but you know, you, you go and you provide a virtual booth and you, there's a reason for people to, to download the piece of content that you've got available. Uh, those sorts of things, the top of the funnel. Next up would be the consideration. So building a long-term strategy with a platform like this, right? So uh, the easiest way to switch to these types of things, Uh, the most cost-effective way to migrate from spreadsheet to CRM, for example, Uh, the most effective way to onboard team members to to these types of platforms if you're buying a new innovative technology. Those are the sorts of things that we, we see working really well in, the, in that sort of consideration interest stage. Mm-hmm. Um, and then when you get to the decision stage, of course, this is a hot, hot lead for the sales team, right? So you've got people who are contacting you. They've signed up. They want to see a demo. They want to see a proof of concept. Mm-hmm. They want to see a proposal or a case study or something like that. And so the content you're really going to need there are your sales basics, the consistent sales deck that you can use and you can evolve. It's a one page summary. If somebody says, send me your one pager, you have to have that ready to go. And you know, a lot of smaller businesses don't, don't really think about that. And they're like, oh, I don't have it available. Um, a template. So if you've got a, a software or a process that actually you're going to walk people through, why would you not have a template for that? So a project plan template, we are here. We're going to go along this path together and we're going to get there. Brilliant to be able to pull up a visual. Um, would that be a framework? In itself, yeah. A template or a framework to be able to walk people through. Very much like we have the review, refine, roll out, replace. We can talk with people and say, well, here's where we are. Here's where we're going to start. Here's the things that we're going to look at together. Here's the information that we're going to need in order to be able to look at that. Here's the collaboration that we'll do and so on. And so if you're creating content to try and fill that part of your funnel, then creating a framework or a template like that can work really well. Uh, Lots more examples like that. So, you know, cost revenue modeling exercises, ROI calculators, those sorts of things. And then in the advocacy, um, once you've got somebody up and running and you've done some consultation with them after they're starting to see results, then you can start interviewing them. You can start breaking down the results into case studies visually. You can start getting them to speak with you at events. You can start getting them to contribute to written content that you're doing, those sorts of things. Oh, I do like, um, and you mentioned before, is you're trying to give people a simple, um, you're simplifying, remove the friction for them to make a decision. Yeah. And so, you know, our focus is working with founders who are trying to get themselves out of the day-to-day sales and help enable a growth team, which means adding in salespeople who can hit these repeatable processes. And if you can support a sales and marketing team by planning to create these types of content, so they've always got something at hand that they can walk people through, then your business is much more likely to grow sustainably because they're not having to make it up as they go along. 
they can actually just go into your content library and pull something up and use it as a reference point to talk people through. And that's easier for a lot of people to, to do, which means that they can save their energy for communication and listening rather than having to create on the fly. Mm. Yeah, one of the best I've seen doing that uh, is uh, digital marketer, Ryan Dice. Um, they yeah. do that. They, very, very, very clever marketers um, sort of, they provide framework. Very, very sharp. Yeah, no, it's, they've done a great job over the last 10 years, I think it is now. So um, thanks for that. I think that gives us a great overview of the content needed to take people from awareness to consideration um, to the sale and then to the advocacy, which um, is uh, really where you, they become just loyal fans um, and uh, are going to talk about you. So yeah. now the other thing I wanted to touch on is you mentioned HubSpot. Now, HubSpot is a great tool. Um, uh, they're out of Boston. Uh, they've, I think they've, I don't know, the last time they ran an event, I think it was 15,000 people go to it. Um, I've dealt with them over the years and uh, worked with them. We've done some joint marketing exercise together based around content and uh, a great bunch of people and incredible culture. And uh, they thought of inbound content marketing before anyone had any idea. But content marketing's around a long time. But uh, they, they package it up and um, create a technology for it. So HubSpot, an amazing company. What other sort of CRMs are out there now that have turned up? Because HubSpot um, is pretty big platform now, isn't it? So it it's, can be quite complicated. So you sort of take a deep breath um, and going, okay, if I start this journey, it's going to take a fair bit of time and resources to put in place. Um, we've, we've used platforms and still do use Infusionsoft, which... Um, has the nickname of Confusion Soft um, <laughs> um, in the industry. I've heard that one. <laughs> so, are there any simple CRMs? And that's uh, the problem is that quite often, like you buy Word, you buy you know, Excel, and everyone uses like 3% of it, right? So, are there any simple CRMs out there for people to cut their teeth on before they dive into maybe a, a HubSpot that you think are great in terms of taking people from the consideration through to sales? Yeah. Um, honestly, I am going to endorse HubSpot for that stage, and here's why. It's free. Mm -hmm. The HubSpot free version is everything you need from a B2B CRM if you're running a sales team. If you're a marketer and you're doing all sorts of different marketing and you're doing lots of different campaigns and email automations and that sort of thing, then you've got different considerations. There are actually a series of um, bolt-ons to HubSpot now that don't necessarily use HubSpot's own marketing automation tools uh, that are now available and can work with the CRM. And um, that they can be quite useful, but what we see is most of the time people will get a lot of value out of a very simple email platform and a very simple CRM platform until they're ready to bring the two together. So, you know, they may start with just going, okay, here are the stages of my sales process. And if they're a founder and they're just adding a couple of sales people, that's typically where they'll be. Uh, there's a lot of people who use Pipedrive. There's a lot of people who use HubSpot. There are many others out there, but functionally they're very, very similar. You go from one stage to another. The thing that you've got to pay attention to is what is the sales process that you're actually using? Mm -hmm. Do you have a discovery meeting and then you have a demo meeting and then you have a negotiation meeting and then you have a sign off meeting and a handover meeting? Or do you have a discovery and a case study together, for example? You know, in some services businesses, you, you don't need to break it into two pieces. In some software companies, you don't need to break it into two pieces. Uh, and it really depends if you've got somebody running the whole sales cycle or whether you've got somebody booking meetings and handing it off to an account exec. So my, the recommendation is keep it simple and keep it cheap until you're ready to really invest. Make sure that you've documented it. Use something like Lucidchart to be able to show the flow of your sales process. 
then decide what technology you need. I, I would always say, don't go in and buy something heavy and expensive that you can't possibly commit the hours to use until you're ready to do that. Because like you say, people use three, four, five percent of these platforms. And if they're spending hundreds or even thousands a month on them, it's going to burn. Uh, whereas if, unless, when they, if they're ready for it, then they'll get great return on investment from it. So I would say keep it simple. HubSpot CRM is a great CRM to start off with. If you're just starting on your content marketing journey, there are so many different ways of, of doing email follow-ups. Lots of different email platforms out there that people can use. They don't necessarily have to be from the same brand to start off. Uh, but it's when you're getting to the point where you're going to add one, two salespeople and full-time marketers into your team that they're going to want to have in, uh, real strong input into what the technology they want to use is. And that, that's the point where you're going to get your checkbook out and, and really look at the investment. Uh, so, you know, to get you from zero to your first 10 clients, it's, it shouldn't be a concern. You can use a spreadsheet. You know, to get you from 10 to 100, you might start investing in something light. Um, and then to go beyond that, you're going to be building a team of people who are going to have an input into that. And the simpler, the better to get you off the ground. That's, I think it's great advice. And um, because I know for a lot of people they're going, um, and at the other end, I think the complexity and cost funnel is uh, Salesforce, I think is one quite a complicated platform, very powerful. Uh, yeah. And there's a bunch of others out there as well. So let's talk a little bit about um, uh, what Mind Race Consulting does um, in terms of, uh, and what they've observed with uh, remote work, because remote work has become a real thing over the last 12 months. Um, it's even got its own acronym now, work from home, um, work FH, WFH uh, is quite often tossed around at companies and the HR manager is always on the, uh, I suppose, hunt to make sure that if things blow up in a city with you know, what's going on with COVID and the pandemic, that uh, they're making sure their employees are safe. So what are some of your observations of remote work and the challenges and the opportunities that you see with uh, remote work and uh, companies that have done well in this time and those that are struggling? Yeah, sure. So first of all, re remote work is, has been accelerating for a, a much longer time than, uh, than COVID has caused it. Yeah, we, I worked with a couple of different businesses over the last few years that are looking at flexible office space. Uh, and making it easier for companies to access multiple offices all over the place. And obviously, the, you've got the WeWorks of the world who, who've developed a very popular brand of being able to do that. But there are software businesses that are making it easy for much larger businesses to buy units mm. of working time in lots of different locations for their, uh, for their distributed teams. Because the HR teams have been recognizing for some time that people want that quality of life as well as being able to commit their time to work but they might want to have a dedicated workspace wherever they are. And so, you know, this has been happening for, for a long time. The large corporate monolith uh, headquarters are, yeah, it, at least it seems to us to be less popular than they were. And instead, it's the access to global talent. It's the access to people who are comfortable, focused and relaxed and able to add value to projects. And, this last year obviously has put a real magnifying glass on that and and the businesses that had already invested in things like a really solid crm a really solid project management tool and in the world of sales there are a couple of tools which record and transcribe calls and you know from a coaching perspective which is, is a lot of the work that we do working with teams that are trying to get better working with teams that are trying to grow these sorts of software platforms for coaching and, and breaking down calls and giving feedback and those sorts of things are really valuable because it saves you from having to be there at the same time the old ride along and instead somebody can send you a snippet and say hey i think i messed up here can you give me some guidance or how could i do this better and so the, the teams that are really going to thrive going forward 
are the ones that adopt that mindset. How can we support our workers wherever they are? Because if they come back to the office, they're still going to be wearing a headset. They're still going to be talking to people on Zoom and they're going to be doing business internationally a lot of the time. Mm. And that percentage is skewing all the time as people get more and more comfortable with it. And so those that have already decided, okay, look, whether we go back to the office or not, we need to help our teams be successful. They can invest in those sorts of tools. So again, transparency of work. And I'm a big fan of the way that technology is built in an agile environment when they have daily stand-ups and they tell each other what's going on and they get stuff unstuck and unblocked. Why not bring that to your sales and marketing team? We do. Yeah, we, we get marketing projects unstuck. We get salespeople to collaborate with marketing projects because, hey, can you give me a hand with this? Or we're going to do this webinar. Let's have a sidebar. That happens. And you're managing it on a project management tool in a way that you would never have that sort of collaboration before. It was always, a, there was a wall between <laughs> sales and marketing. Mm. And so the, the best teams are the ones that recognize that people are, involved in many more things at the same time today mm -hmm. you look at look at gen z and look at how many jobs each one of them has got you know mm -hmm. they're a content producer and a marketer and a salesperson and a model and a, and a this and a that all at the same time and and millennials are doing more and more of that as well everyone's got a side hustle you know so they're, they're those sorts of multitasking and things that are going on everyone's got developing and using more skills than ever before uh, and so, you know, the businesses that recognize that and, and give people the tools to make it easy, I think are going to be the ones that are really going to be successful going forward mm. and vice versa. Yeah. You mentioned, uh, you know, tools. In other words, the companies that provide the right tools for their staff to, to do remote work well and, to, and, to, and also to develop a healthy company culture, look after their staff. What are some of the top tools you've seen in remote work? You did mention that uh, there are tools that, for example, uh, record, I think, video as well as audio, as well as turn that into, a, uh, into text or transcript. What yeah. are some of the tools you've found? That, and what are, those two, what are those tools that you did mention before? The two most common ones that we use, uh, there's one that's called Chorus, uh, which will just work alongside Zoom and it will be but almost taking notes for you while you're doing a Zoom call. It'll be transcribing it, and afterward you can review it, you can send snippets to people, you can, you can work with your manager on getting coaching. And another platform that does very much the same thing that's called Jiminy out of the UK, they're great guys. Uh, and it's another layer that works alongside whether you're using Google Meets or, or Zoom to provide that coaching function to automatically make it easy to recognize when some one person's talking or the other person's talking visually. So that you can go and coach the parts where, okay, well, your prospect has finished speaking. Uh, let's zoom back 15 seconds. Did they respond to that? And you can listen the whole thing through faster. You can pick out things that they said and, and coach on it. They're the sorts of tools that just make it easy to help mm -hmm. people at scale. Right. How do you spell chorus and how do you spell Jiminy? Because, uh, yeah, it's chorus, C H O R U S. It's they're configured for larger sales teams. Uh, the, the core market is, is uh, SaaS teams with larger sales teams. Uh, and then there's Jiminy, which is J I M I double N Y. Both are, uh, I believe they're both dot com. Um, and they're, they're both great businesses. They do similar things and, and they both integrate well with CRMs and with mm. Zoom to make it really easy for you to look after the people who are having relationships with people in your team. So that's basically these tools are almost, uh, I suppose it's like a video text documentation of you transferring skills to your team. Is that what, how you describe it? Um, you can do it that way. Yeah. So one of the things that we do is when we are looking to replace ourselves, 
we'll make sure that the process is documented and we'll make sure that there are examples of everything that takes place along the sales process. And these tools are great ways of doing that. So here's a great way of doing a discovery call in this business. Here's a great way of doing a case study call in this business. Here's a great way of doing a negotiation for this type of deal. If you can just use the snippet from that and put that into your training manual, everybody's then got a good example, audio visually with a transcript of what works. Mm -hmm. So they, they make it much easier to use those sorts of current, captured in the moment, natural flow mo uh, videos rather than a stuffy training video which doesn't really relate to the moment. So they're great for those sorts of things, but also teams can share things with each other hey, I'm stuck here, can you help me with this? And they'll slack it to each other. And within a few seconds, somebody could be listening to it and then just say, yeah, actually try this, hmm. respond. So, And these are done, so I suppose a lot of the recordings done in the cloud, it's actually a, a link um, rather than an attachment. Yes, that's right, yeah. So it's, hmm. all done, it's all done in the cloud. You can then just choose the, t the time window that you want to share. Uh, click the snippet, share it with whoever you want to share it with externally to your business, internally from your business. Uh, and Slack is the backbone of all of this, right? The internal communications with teams who are wherever. Mm -hmm. And you can get this non-linear uh, non communication and just share it in channels if it's helpful for the sales team to learn about it. You can put your whole thing there, your whole meeting. Uh, if you want to get some feedback on something, you can send it to your manager or your peers. Uh, if you want to take a snippet of something the customer said, an advocate said, and share it with marketing and say, hey, here's what this happy customer just said. And the marketing team has a gleeful moment and then, and then says, well, can we, can we use the quote? And then you can begin to close the, the circle there. You sure. capture these, these things in the, in the moment. Yeah. This is a fascinating aspect of recording. Uh, we're used to recording life as in, we record our life on Facebook and share it. We record it and share it on Instagram. Uh, we record our activities using a Garmin or a smartwatch now that uh, records your activities and how much sleep did I get last night? Um, so, but, and this is, I had an aha moment about two or three weeks ago and I've mentioned this before. Um, I went to a meeting, a face-to-face -face meeting, which is very rare. Um, I hadn't done one for a while. Uh, I went there after an hour, lovely chat. We covered a lot of things, had a lot of in-depth, you know, uh, uh, I suppose some really good snippets of information. I walked away from there and went, uh, we didn't record this. Um, <laughs> no, one, no one took notes. And I'm going, we actually haven't recorded uh, what we discussed. Um, so it was a meet and greet. I'm one of my past podcast guests, very sharp operator. Um, provides uh, growth for startups and then also helps introduce them to people that fund. And I went, this is weird. I didn't record the conversation at a face-to-face -face meeting and it felt so, whereas I've been doing face-to-face -face meetings since forever, right? And I'm going, I didn't record it. And, um, and, and we've always struck these moments like, let's go to a cricket match in English and the Australians don't understand that. And you're going, <laughs> and you go, Oh, he got out and going, um, and it's one of those matches where it's not being shown on the big screen and going, uh, look up for the screen because you want to see the replay. Um, we're recording more and more of life, aren't we? And business. Yeah. And, uh, I think some of the tools we're bringing now are capturing, uh, some of the best wisdom of founders and the top people in your company and just distilling their skills and recording it. Uh, I think the acceleration of, uh, of right work, because that's what's happened. I, I believe that we've maybe rushed 10 years into the future in the last 12 months. Um, yes, we're all moving towards it, but we didn't, um, it was still a very slow, gradual change. And then you've got the challenge between startups and you know, younger founders versus old traditional industries that are around and the, you know, a lot of them are using legacy tools. Um, I think there's gonna be some profound change and evolution from rapid uh, within corporate and business that 
I'm experiencing. And part of the fun of having these conversations is um, hearing a repeat of, uh, of, okay, we should be recording it. How can we train? How can we document? How can we uh, you know, track best practice and, and do asynchronous communication instead of having to show up to a meeting, do it. We can actually record once, share many times. So it, it's yeah. interesting. I, I definitely needed to do that because I initially always liked to show up to meetings and be a hundred percent present. And so if I find that if I'm typing and I'm, I'm not listening at the same time. So a few years ago, I invested in something that looks like a, a huge microphone sort of almost like a tricorder off Star Trek, if you've ever seen one of those. And we used to plonk it in the middle of the table. Yes. And I'd just say, look, we're gonna, I'm going to record everything here uh, just so that I can give everything my full attention. And then we can go back and we can transcribe it later on. And then in that evolved to be able to upload those files to something like rev.com, which can then quickly transcribe either using AI or humans. And now you've got apps. If you wanted to record that in-person meeting over coffee, You've got apps like Otter, which you can install on your smartphone and just press a button, put it on the table and Otter will be listening away and making, making notes for you as you actually sit out in the open. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, so that if everywhere we are now, there are opportunities to harness technology to make things easier. And, you know, as you're on the train on the way back or when you get back to the, to the apartment or office, you can then just send a snippet with some notes in it from, from a meeting that has automatically been transcribed for you. Mm. And you know, those sorts of bits of enablement are just going to accelerate. Mm. And it's so exciting to be able to do that and, and to share knowledge in, in such an easy way. Um, but of course, first, you've got to develop knowledge. You've got to organize it in a way that makes sense. And then you can actually share it with people. And, and that's really where we have brought the biggest value add is helping people stack those blocks in the right order and then record those bits and then roll it out and show people how to use it, coach them as they're getting used to it. And then it, the thing begins to evolve really quickly. And technology has just enabled that all the way through. And uh, you know, for businesses that operate using legacy systems and are, and are slower to adopt these sorts of tools, we're genuinely seeing a lot of market opportunity missed uh, by them not investing and being able to share that knowledge with people who might have joined their team, but see an easier opportunity with somewhere that's already got their knowledge base nailed uh, and they can easily onboard remotely because, hey, who knows when they can go back to the office for a training session. Exactly. I, I think that's um, one of the beauties and uh, amazing things that's happening at the moment is getting information out of people's heads and recording it and organizing it and documenting it and i think distilling that sort of noise and complexity that sits in someone's head and also as we do research trying to get that into an organized and distilled structure that makes sense and that's why i love writing for example i love the fact that you get research from here research from there and go okay how can i make this make sense to someone in this uh, complex environment and complex area. So I, maybe we're seeing a new explosion of human uh, education and intelligence being enhanced by the machines that uh, are recording what we do and organizing it for us. Um, and maybe that's the next part of it is the AI will go in and take the conversation and turn it into a structured distilled piece of content maybe that's what's next and maybe it's already being done. There's definitely some interesting AIs out there. Yeah. And uh, at this time, it's super exciting to be able to continuously see new things being developed to help us all get better at what we do. Mm -hmm. it's, it's so exciting. And, and, you know, from a business perspective, there's huge opportunities there. From an educational perspective, huge opportunities as well. And, mm. you know, you certainly never run out of new things to learn about these days. And uh, it's, it's an exciting time to be helping people grow businesses and help people uh, learn more about what's now possible. Exactly. So just before we finish up, um, can, we, can you share maybe a couple of things that you think are really, really important for B2B companies um, today that they should be um, considering? Uh, yeah, I mean, going into 2021, the, the, the trends are that people are spending more and more time 
trying to avoid meaningless communication and trying instead to communicate with lots of different people about lots of different things at the same time. So that means that as a marketer, your complexity is increased massively. Uh, you've got to really think about where people want to be engaged with. You know, like Clubhouse, brand new thing. Yeah, can you, would it be worthwhile you going and listening to some Clubhouse discussions to understand what your target market is talking about, to really develop topics that are really helpful to them these, right now, be what people are really thinking about right now. We're seeing a lot of value in that for businesses that are not sure how their markets are reacting in 21. Personalization, it's table stakes now. It's not just about dear first name anymore. You've got to be thinking about how you can add value for that person in any sort of outreach. And investing in the data, once you get beyond the, your first 10 or 20 clients, really understanding your data, like how is this person getting value from our product or our service? What is that going to look like in the long term? What have we learned about these people? These, again, they're, they're table stakes things that if you're not doing them, other people are going to accelerate past you as they know that customer better and retain them for longer and add on more and more services for that person uh, it, it's going to be harder to get hold of them as people engage with with specific brands more and more so you know we're seeing an increasing difficulty in getting those meetings but when you do if you can really show up for that person by researching everything you know about them and the way that they got to you through that marketing funnel and really applying stories that make sense to them, not generic demos, not generic stories about people who are nothing like them. That's how the, the businesses are having to differentiate and, and recognizing that you've got to meet people where they are. Mm. You know, Some people will want to go to a trade show and shake hands and, and that's how they'll want to do business. And those people who are there, if there's a trade show that's on, sometimes that business might think about uh, going and sending somebody who wants to go and do business that way as well. But equally, there'll be somebody who doesn't want to do business that way at the moment and not for a foreseeable time. So if you've got to have a digital channel open to be able to engage people who want to have a Zoom call with you now, who wouldn't have done 18 months ago, and both of those things are not going to go away. People are going to be cautious even when we start coming back to the norm. So, you know, really investing in a simple, repeatable process that you can follow in person or virtually and really enabling your team by having those sorts of tools that help them get support. That's the baseline for a growing business in 21. And then recognizing that you might find your next best hire somewhere you would never have looked before because does it matter anymore that they're in your local area mm. or just that they can help your ideal customer? So if you look at it as an opportunity to engage with great people and potentially extend the reach of your business and, and, and the team that you're working with, it can be a really great year. And we've seen a lot of businesses starting very positively, hiring people, getting comfortable with licenses for more software, but less rent. Uh, because they've downsized their office space and instead spent it on technology. So, yeah, that, that's some of the things that that we help people think through, and uh, it, it's it's certainly a lot to to consider. Sales technology, per month user on spending of software, what CRMs to get, but it all starts with have you got a repeatable process and are you able to train people effectively to get on board? Because if you can, then you can start adding more and more fuel to the fire. And you can scale, which is, I think that is great advice. So, um, Dan Morris, thank you very much for your time. How can people, if they want to engage with Mind Racer, um, how can they contact you if they want to have a chat? Yeah, absolutely. Jeff, thank you very much for having me. It's been a real pleasure. Um, if anyone would like to reach out and have a chat, um, they can go to mindracerconsulting.com. There's a form on there. There's also a lot of free resources on there that they can access and, and download. And uh, if they want to have a conversation, we're more than happy to run an initial audit with them, no cost to help them understand where they're at. And um, hopefully we can get towards helping more and more people every year. And uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to share some of this experience with the audience. 
Thanks, Dan. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for sharing your wisdom and learning with the world and with my listeners. And uh, look forward to catching up uh, in real life somewhere. Um, That'd be lovely. Maybe a beer in New York or a, or a wine or a, uh, whatever. And uh, so looking forward to uh, catching up in real life. At yes, some stage. absolutely. Absolutely. All the best until then. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Dan.